now it's also for me a privilege to introduce uh, Dr. Andy Broth. Uh, Andy's uh, uh, this afternoon, he's the old alumnus of Da Vinci. Uh, he did his uh, uh, doctorate with us uh, many years ago. And uh, the topic or the focus this afternoon is on leadership, the exponential effect. So uh, if I can introduce uh, Andy, uh, Dr. Andrew Broth is an international leadership and organizational development consultant and chartered marketer. He's also the founder of the Broth Leadership Institute based outside Neisner, a very nice part of South Africa, as a facilitator, as a lecturer, as a broadcaster, and a keynote speaker. And he has more than 25 years of wide ranging professional experience. And he's an executive educational specialist in strategy, sales and marketing, leadership, teams, and corporate reputation. And he consults for many international blue chip companies and speakers on issues pertaining to strategy, team and people development. His international facilitation experience means he brings a professional understanding to issues around strategic foresight, diversity, teamwork, leadership and sales and marketing. And he has a master's degree in organizational leadership and a PhD in business management from the Da Vinci Institute of Technology Management with the specialization in leadership and corporate reputation. He has facilitated over three and a half thousand programs to audiences in more than 80 countries. He's also an experienced conference moderator and has worked in the corporate, government, and non for profit sectors. He's also the author of a leadership book, The Leadership, The Exponential Effect. And that book will be released uh, in November this year. And, you know, I think it's a privilege having Andy here this afternoon to uh, share some of his insights and thoughts, not from the press or from the horse's mouth before it's published later this year. So we will be talking about uh, some insights in the book that uh, it's not available yet, uh, but uh, Andy will talk to us more about that. HB, thank you very, very much. It's a real privilege to be back uh, in my old stomping ground, although yeah. virtually, and uh, greetings from the garden route this afternoon. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, yeah, it's a privilege to having you back as a Da Vinci and to a fellow Da Vinci and uh, welcome here. So, Andy, um, from what I've said in the beginning on, on the accountability of leadership and, you know, Mark mentioned the whole thing about uh, systemic thinking and how that changed the way we, we think about our health and leadership. Um, my question to you as, as a latch on to that, um, after if you've written this book that's available in the market soon, uh, November, I think you've said to me the previous time, uh, in your view, how do you think is leadership changing? Well, it definitely is changing, HB, and I think it's changing from a traditional, in many cases, command and control approach to a more leader follower and now to a leader stakeholder approach. Uh, this means that it's less about formal position and more about one's ability to influence. So if we think about a 360 view of the stakeholders we might be working with. Uh, the other word that I, I think about in terms of that question was something that was mentioned in our introduction, which is integration. So I think leadership now is much more about an ability to integrate work and life. Uh, we've seen that even since the, the lockdown that those uh, compartments that we created before are no longer there. There may even be, you know, Chinese walls or thin walls. Um, and I think certainly leadership is also changing because it's much more about remote. It's about being able to lead people from a distance over time zones, geography. Um, I think leadership certainly has changing, changed because it's about uh, the reputation economy. Uh, and I think against the backdrop of the research that's been done recently by Edelman, uh, HP, um, a concern where leadership needs to really wake up is that in a recent study around trust, no mm. single institution, and I would argue by implication, uh, leader of that institution is regarded as both competent and ethical. So some are seen as competent and not ethical. Some are seen as ethical but not competent. But we definitely sit right now with a huge trust deficit when it comes to leaders right across the sector, whether we're talking about business, uh, parastatal, um, you know, academics have, have held some ground, but, you know, we need to certainly pull our socks up. Um, and, and certainly on the political landscape, there's a huge trust deficit as well. Yeah. And yeah, I, I appreciate what you say. So, so my observation is the very fine balance 
between those two. And, and you know, I'm, I'm curious about, and I know this is the topic of your book uh, that we will see in November, but from your experience, you know, looking at that fine balance, what would you say are, are the principles of effective leadership that we can take home? And I think by looking at the, the people in the audience, uh, many of the colleagues are, are ex-doctorates of us, prominent business people. Um, so on behalf of them, what are, are the, the principles of effective leadership in your view? And I know it's hard, but to every person have an opinion about that, but um, we would really love to get your thoughts on that, Andy. So I'm going to answer that in two ways, HP. And the first answer is it was difficult to know what to leave out. When you talk about leadership, the yeah. exponential effect, and you think about leading yourself and then leading others and then leading teams and then leading for results, that was kind of the golden thread that I was trying to develop with this exponential effect. Um, and maybe a short answer is if we go back to something that we worked with um, some years ar back around leadership was the whole VUCA concept, mm. um, HP, this idea that um, we are live in a world that's volatile and uncertain and complex and ambiguous. That was the, the VUCA minus. The prime of that, the VUCA positive, is that we need vision and understanding and clarity and agility. But I think more recently, we need to change it from VUCA to VUCAR and have an R on the end. Uh, there is a sense in which the world in which we live is recurrent. It's somewhat relentless. Um, this thing, I think, even that we live with now, the challenge is it's it doesn't have a finite end. And so the mm. VUCAR positive would be something to do with resilience. Yeah. Um, so launching from that then, I then added another 11 principles. The first three would be around self-leadership. So for me, you can't lead others if you can't lead yourself. So character, purpose, and resilience. Um, leading others, I looked at uh, issues around trust, communication, mm. and influence. Uh, when it comes to teams, I think you need alignment. You need really clear uh, strategies for conflict resolution. Not all conflict is bad. And then this word that we bandy around, which has almost become a buzzword of collaboration and, and really trying to understand what does that look like in this new world of work that you've alluded to. And then I think the last section around leading for results, um, and I am a strong believer that leadership must produce results. Um, and certainly that comes out from the research that's been done. So we want to talk about execution. Um, we want to talk about accountability. And I think very importantly, uh, as you've been doing at Da Vinci even this week, HB, it's about celebration. And I think that we need to look for those opportunities as leaders to celebrate. Um, mm. And I don't think we celebrate enough. In fact, I think that the, the annual performance review is certainly um, way past its sell-by date, um, simply because it's not timeless enough in many cases, to give followers the kind of feedback they need in the moment. So those are some of the principles. And, and again, in the book, I un unpack each of those with some research and then some personal narrative. And then I interviewed uh, a number of industry leaders about their perspectives on those. Yeah. No, no, I, I fully agree. And, and you, know, um, you know my view on this, you know, a leader should lead from the back, you know, uh, allow people to really excel and, you know, take control of that. I see there's a comment of Philip de Kock who say, in a sense we have, and thank you, Philip, in a sense we have been talking about the need for leader follower mode quite some time, and you've touched on that, Andy. And my experiences, however, we still see command and control in many organizations, and that's to your point about the, the performance review. What is your experience? Is that changing? And if it's changing, what is the impetus for change, Andy? So two answers to Philip's question. Thank you for that, Philip. I think that leader follower is still there. I like to talk about leader stakeholder. So it's not just follower. There are many other people that you influence as a leader. And then to your point, Philip, I'll give you a practical example. I had um, an initial flurry of interest around our borderless collaboration solutions that we offer from the Institute. So leading virtual teams, managing remote workers. Uh, and I had a number of middle managers saying to me uh, one of two things. Uh, some would say, with lockdown, we've been sent home with a laptop. We've heard absolutely nothing from anybody. We've been left high and dry. Yeah. And then I had another group of people, Philip, saying to me, I'm being compelled to sit in front of my laptop for eight hours a day with my Zoom webcam open 
so that I can log in and log out because my manager wants to make sure that I'm still working. Um, and if that's not an example of a huge trust deficit and a severe lack of understanding of a results only work environment, um, I don't know what is HP. Yeah, no, Andy, I, I agree. I think many organizations, um, my observation is realize they can actually trust their people and the people will put in the hard work. So we need to think about motivation and, and, and those things differently. And I think Mark in his uh, discussion touched on some of those challenges on the well-being of, of people. I see Tia also put a comment here. I wonder if we understand what collaboration means. This also means giving recognition to the people who collaborate with a leader. I agree with you, Tia. I think uh, uh, it's also listening to Andy, you know, they need to be equal standing. It's not um, I'm the, the leader and you the follow. It's more for co-creation. And together we can solve and through synergy, uh, we can, can bring this to the fore. Um, when I'm looking at the audience, I, I know some of the people in here, um, some of my colleagues, business partners and friends uh, are definitely very passionate about the environment of coaching and, you know, mentoring. And, and I think, Andy, um, my next question in, in that area, maybe to, to probe you or to put it, uh, um, considering the, the coaching and the mentoring, do you think a leader can make work more productive and enjoyable simultaneously? Is, is that possible? HP, the short answer is yes. And I think climate is critical. So for me, when I'm working with leaders, either as a coach or I'm helping them to coach, um, setting up that psychological safety is paramount. And we need to understand more about this. You know, do we encourage our people to take risks? Do we encourage collective problem solving and goal attainment? Are people given the freedom to speak up? Um, are we helping people to identify their strengths and to step into those and own those? And as leaders, what are we doing to reduce, say, uh, misunderstanding um, and ambiguity and confusion? So in answer to your question around, you know, how do leaders make work more productive and enjoyable? I think that's what people want. And if you do that and then leave them to shine, um, mm. then this micromanagement really becomes completely unnecessary. Yeah. Andy, can I come and work for you? I love what you say. <laughs> um, I don't want to put people on the spot here, but, but uh, looking at the audience, there's definitely some seasoned business people, entrepreneurs, uh, CEOs here. Um, so it would be interesting to, to get some views from the floor uh, in this regard that uh, what you shared with us, Andy, and what we spoke about, to, to talk a little bit more about the lessons learned in the past. Well, I think, again, I can answer that on a number of levels, um, HP. I can answer it personally. I can answer it in terms of the research that I was doing when I, I looked at the whole question of responsible leadership and reputation six or seven years ago. And I could probably answer it you know, around the book. So let me start with personal experience. I think some of the lessons I've learned as a consultant um, and as a husband and as a father um, is that we often become obsessed by comparison. You know, mm. we, we, we often go to that imposter syndrome of I can't or I'm not able or I'm not as good as. And that's a really mind-numbing, paralyzing view to take, H. because the truth is you're reasoning from the basis of deficit rather yeah. than the basis of strength. So I think comparison is the first thing I really would want people to avoid. Um, in the negative sense. There's nothing wrong with benchmarking. There's nothing wrong with trying to, you know, achieve differentiation. But I'm talking about that energy sapping comparison that almost uh, forces you to do nothing because you have that nagging doubt that you're not good enough. Um, I think the second personal lesson would be not to be obsessed by obligation. Um, you know, we've heard a lot about servant leadership and servant leadership is a wonderful principle. But I think one of the challenges with servant leadership, when it's so focused on the individual follower, uh, my question is, where does the organizational goal fit into that? So as a leader, you're running this very delicate balance between trying to serve your followers and mm -hmm. release them into what they have as terms of calling, but you still have a performance agreement of your own that needs no. to be achieved and you're answerable to a boss or to mm -hmm. other stakeholders or shareholders. So I think obligation and doing things out of obligation 
um, can be very paralyzing as well. So that would be on a personal level. On a research level, the important lesson would be uh, the power of responsibility, HP. And maybe we'll spend some time, you know, circling back to that. You started the conversation today talking about um, accountability. And I almost see responsibility and accountability as two um, bulwarks, if you like, of, of a bridge. Um, you need both to get things done, but one can be delegated and one cannot. Um, there was a classic case with our Minister of Education some years ago where we had a lack of delivery of textbooks yeah. um, to schools. And, and I'm only quoting what she said in the press, so I'm not, not trying to make a political statement here. But she went on record saying, I'm not, not responsible for delivering textbooks, which of course is absolutely correct. But she is accountable as the Minister of Education for making sure that you know, students have what they need. So I think too often in leadership circles, we dodge the responsibility question, HB, and we, we then want to try and move the buck somewhere else. And, and I think that one of the key things in this new world of work will be to have much tighter definition around expectations, around responsibility, but also an acknowledgement as a leader that when I delegate a task to somebody else who then is made responsible, that as the person who's owning that project or has been given the lead on that, I am still accountable for execution. And so navigating that from a leadership perspective is really important. And even as I was listening to Mark earlier today, it made me realize how the responsibility accountability debate will need to be front and center when it comes to medical providers, private and public uh, medical aids, the role of, yeah. of the state, and, and working out that accountability question. Um, I, I think that accountability is the scorecard of responsibility, HP. Andy, I, I appreciate that. And I think that's a, a very valid point, that we, we, we broaden our understanding and definitely look at responsibility and almost say to each other, uh, as a leader, you know, it's not just being accountable. You definitely have certain responsibilities. And, and maybe in, in a new world, you know, uh, that, that's a different balance. And I see this comment from, from Paul Shahanes um, that say, you know, it's all about uh, have we found the self-awareness. And maybe that's, that's part of the, the answer to that is to understand the, the purpose and to be purpose-driven and say what's the, the real uh, purpose of a business, you know, is it there to serve society? And early on, you reflected on, on the, the role of the state, and even Mark touched on that. And I think Portia, um, definitely, you know, that's, I, I think that's definitely it. I also see Philip saying here, uh, there's an article by uh, Coyle D in 2019, the author of Culture Code argued that status relationships or perceptions in this regard have an important influence in successful delivery. Uh, any insights in that regard that with respect to leadership, Andy? Well, well, let me kick off on the status question, HP, because it is a very topical one. And I think there is also a cultural context here. So in the African context, if we're talking about leadership, we cannot deny the fact that status, hierarchy, even patriarchy in some places, plays a critical role. And so we have to, uh, you know, navigate the complexities of, of, of status when it comes to leadership. But I make the point that in a team, conflict around status is as much about power as it is about um, perceived hierarchy. Um, and I think very often we get so caught up on the status issue that we then allow that to take precedent over questions around task or process or responsibility. So, you know, I haven't read the, the, the COIL article that Philip's referring to, but, you know, perceptions around status are critical. Um, and what I'm trying to move the debate towards HP is to say, if status is tied to position and we want to lead from the basis of authority, that's very 20th century. Um, we now need to understand how to influence without authority to understand this ecosystem where in an organization, I may, may well be needing to lead people who are not my direct reports and over whom I have no authority. And therefore, if we're talking about status, 
that status cannot be tied to position or title. It will have to be status achieved through um, expertise or through network or through positivity. So I think we need to un unpack what we mean by the status and where that comes from, HB, as it relates to the currencies of influence, um, the sources of power that help us to move things along in terms of the leadership question. Yes, I wanted to add also to this, uh, the comment that was made around the, the culture code question. Um, and, and this whole concept of culture, ecosystem, et cetera, et cetera. Years and years and years ago, a guy by the name of Eric Byrne wrote a book and he talked about um, the parent, the adult and the child perspective. And I think that for decades and centuries, in fact, we've had a system that is based on a parent-child relationship, on the hierarchy that you were just talking about, Andy. And we all collectively sustain that system. So it isn't just the leaders who sustain the system, although they play a very significant role in it, but the so-called followers perpetuate it as well. And uh, I think one of the greatest challenges that we have as we move to try and shift the whole system so that it is more egalitarian and it is more accountable and, um, yeah, we, we get rid of the sort of command and control idea is that actually everybody's got to shift. Mm. Um, we can't, because we perpetuate the notion of I need, I need a daddy to tell me what to do. Otherwise, I don't take responsibility and I don't do what I'm supposed to do. It's very easy to say to a leader, don't be commanding and controlling. But as you said just now, Andy, when my, uh, my performance appraisal is dependent on your performance, it's very difficult not to be commanding and controlling if you're not doing your job. So, yeah, just a whole bunch of thoughts around that. And I think it's a really exciting phase for leadership and organizations to be shifting in. Uh, but it's going to be very, very interesting. Yeah. So, Janet, I, I think what you're saying, it takes two to tango. You know, that's, that's definitely, without any doubt, the case. Can I maybe ask you as, as a follow-up to that, um, that being said, how can, or in your mind, how can one ensure that you have the most successful execution of your strategies as a leader? Yeah, I think that there are a lot of different perspectives, and I think, uh, for me, one of the, the responses I would have is that, you know, we have to all learn to show up as leaders. Um, you know, this notion even of the leader and somebody who has, as Andy said, the title, you know, when everybody thinks of themselves as a leader with responsibility, with a role to play rather than a, a job title, that's one of the things that begins to shift things. Um, but, yeah, part of a leadership or managerial role is managing outcomes um, and providing feedback and, you know, uh, but until such time as we begin to shift those dynamics uh, in some way, and it, and it has to happen at a very local level, I think. You know, you can't change whole organizations at a time, but a leader has influence over this, this sphere of influence um, and can shift it at local level. And yeah. I think that that can then cascade out. No, no, I think that's uh, that's a remark that we should actually take serious there. Andy, your response to that question? Well, what's really interesting in the book, HP, so your question is around how do we ensure successful execution of strategy? Yes. That's the question you're asking, right? Yeah. So as you've read in my short bio, my background is leadership and marketing. Um, and so for years, we would help f companies facilitate strategic plans. And I remember four or five years ago being called by one of our large industry uh, clients who said to us, Andy, our problem is not the strategic plan, it's execution. How do we get from the plan to execution? And so we began to look at relentless execution and the elements of that. And here's what's really interesting. I began to find myself being steered closer and closer to the world of project management, knowing hmm. nothing about it. But as I began to look at project management principles and agile and ideas around the fact that in a project, if you want to execute on that, you've got to set a context, you've got to define the charter, you've got to balance autonomy and authority, you've got to be clear about the scope, you've got to help the people executing being uh, to be comfortable with change. Um, 
you've got to navigate the stakeholders. Those principles, HP, actually work when you talk about strategic execution. And so yeah. I, I make an argument in the book that there's a, almost a convergence coming between agile project management and strategic leadership when it comes to execution, and that maybe we've got to start having a round table and an interdisciplinary conversation because there mm -hmm. are lessons we can learn as leaders uh, from project management. And of course, that then brings yeah. about the whole you know, long-standing debate of leaders versus management. But if we argue that leaders get results, then some of these principles have to apply and need to be integrated into the way that we work as leaders. Uh, Mark asked the question, is it more about thought leadership? And I think maybe to bring that together, Andy, uh, if I, I hear what you say, you say it's about strategic alignment throughout the organization, and making sure that there's this um, symphony so that the orchestra come together and each little component, uh, we have uh, a nice performance at the end that's uh, beautiful to the ear. Well, well, two comments there, HP. The first is a quote. Um, I quote Jeff Lawrence in the book. Uh, he says, there's no such thing as a dysfunctional organization because mm. every organization is perfectly aligned to achieve the results it currently gets. Um, <laughs> that's quite a sobering <laughs> quote. Um, the, no. the second is a story. Um, I, given that I work in the, in the professional speaking arena, one of my colleagues um, is an incredible performer. If you ever get chance to see him, he's called the silent conductor and his name is Steve Barnett. So what Steve does is he hands out colored tubes, uh, five different colors, each of them one on the uh, one note on the pentatonic scale. Mm. Um, and he does this, you know, with 50 people, he does it with a hundred people. Um, he did it in the cricket world cup some years back. I think there may have been 5,000 people, but he doesn't say a word. HP does not speak once. He simply holds up the tube. And if you've got that color, you then carry out the beat that he demonstrates. And then while blue are playing, he then goes to hold up red and he gets red playing and overlay that over blue and green and so on. And eventually he's got this beautiful symphony of yeah. music. He's had the beat in his head. He's had the rhythm and the tune. He's not said a word, but he's got everybody aligned around a common set of working together, a common set of values, a, a common set of purposes. And even though he doesn't articulate anything verbally, he's able to get everybody in that environment, whether it's a room or a stadium, um, to be aligned beautifully. And I think that's just such a powerful metaphor. Um, the th third point I would make is that um, uh, there's an author who talks about the alignment continuum. And he says, mm. the problem with an organization is you may be aiming for alignment, but you only get buy-in. And if you only get buy-in, you may have some people who settle for compliance. And if you yeah. only get compliance, you may have some people who just surrender. And if you only get surrender, you may then find some people are in resistance. Mm. And if you only have resistance, you may find people are in apathy. And if you only have apathy, you may find that people are eventually in sabotage. So yeah. as leaders, we want the alignment. Um, but as Miles Kirsten says, it takes leadership to create the alignment and an absence of leadership results often in one of these others. And in many organizations, I think we're settling for compliance or surrender or apathy um, because we haven't been able to achieve the level of alignment um, that is, is possible or needed. So I think strategic alignment is key. Um, and I talk in the chapter on alignment um, about that. I give two examples, HP. The one is in the world of aerobatics. I had the privilege to interview Alex McPhail. Alex mm. McPhail flew um, Falcon 3 for the Silver Falcons, our South African aerobatic team. And, and you know, he took me mentally and emotionally into the cockpit. And he explained to me how when you're flying Formation 3, in that diamond form formation, you've got to be totally aware of where you are and where your leader is and where those are around you at 900 kilometers an hour or whatever speed it is, you know, and, and thousands of feet above the surface. Um, so that's the one example. The other example which fascinated me is a couple of years back, um, Max Verstappen's team 
the Formula One team, uh, got him into the pit lane, jacked up the car, uh, took off all four tires, put all four tires back on, new tires, uh, put the car down and got him out all under 1.82 seconds. Mm. Um, and it's when you watch that symphony that you talk about HP in slow motion and you see the, the, the dance and the collaboration and the understanding of roles and the high level of trust um, and the interplay between now I come in and now I step back and I make room for somebody else. It's just magnificent when it works. When it goes wrong, you know, people get run over, people get yeah. you know, put on fire. Um, it's disastrous. So I really do think the strategic alignment piece is critical. And as leaders, we need to be owning that and looking for every opportunity to create it, particularly in this new world of work. Yeah. No, and you know, where, where I'm sitting, you know, at, at the Vinci, we, we speak about, and you know this, about the being agile, aligned and engaged, you know, so, so that's definitely the fact. And I, and I think what you're saying, and that's probably more difficult and easier said than done is, in their day-to-day activities to do all of that, what you've explained to us is to almost have a, a, a forward thinking uh, eyesight into the future to be able to see that big picture because um, uh, it's probably more important what you say no to than what you say yes to. So as a leader, you still have that responsibility, but you must do that through people. And I think that point you, you definitely made. Uh, I see Janet here say it's a great quote. Uh, Steve Barnett example is great. It does, of course, work in an audit system. I agree. Business systems are complex. You know, the complexity um, without any doubt, and, and, and maybe to, to latch on to that, Andy, uh, if you look at, at this complexity and it's ever increasing uh, where you are sitting, what is the biggest challenge uh, of, of leading a business these days? Well, HP, this one may surprise you, but um, there's a, quite a lot of research out there you know, where when it comes to challenges, they'll talk about the challenge of honing effectiveness or leading a team or guiding change or even managing stakeholders. Mm. But in my research, I think the biggest challenge is still self-leadership. You know, that I cannot really effectively lead others if I can't lead myself. Um, mm. And maybe that's a good segue for us to go back to the resilience piece. Um, I think Prof uh, Paul Singh was asking about the resilience piece earlier, which we didn't get yeah. to. So that would be my answer, HP, is probably, if I'm honest, the self-leadership piece is where many leaders struggle most. Yeah. Uh, Andy, I engaged the other night at, at uh, one of our graduations. Um, somebody asked me, and I'm going to ask you that question. Um, I want to become a great leader. What must I do? Can I learn that? Is there a few tricks in the book? Where do I start? Well, again, the I think the evidence is now clear, HP, that um, you know, there is the nurture nature debate. Um, and, uh, you know, there's the whole question of leaders, are leaders born or made? I've settled it now once and for all for myself, mm -hmm. that leaders are born to be made. So that means that we can learn it. Some of us will learn it more astutely than others. Um, and the research seems to be telling us, HP, that it's evident early on in the sandpit in the nursery school playground, and it's largely tied to language. So there is something about leaders who can articulate early, who can put ideas into words, and who can convince others of their point of view. Um, and I'm fascinated now, having understood that, watching two-year-olds and three-year-olds and four-year-olds and how they engage, because there are some things that we can understand there about the, uh, about the nature piece. But I do think in terms of the nurture piece, you know, if I didn't believe that HP, I wouldn't have done what I've been doing the last 25 years, which is creating yeah. leadership development and leadership pipelines. I think where to start? Well, let me go back to the, uh, to the methodology that I'm using. If that leader had asked me the same question, HP, I would want to start with leading yourself. And I would start with two questions. Who are you and what are you doing here? So the who are you is character. And what are you doing here is purpose. And if you can get those two questions, I don't want to say waxed. I think all of us, you know, spend our lives trying to answer that. But if you can begin to ask those questions, that's the journey to self-leadership. I always say the journey to leadership begins with emotional intelligence and emotional intelligence starts with self-awareness. Um, and then the resilience question, which Prof Singh was asking about, um, 
I, I now think that's front and center, HP, because if you're not a leader who can navigate the complexities that we've spoken about, maybe just to share with you some other research, psychologists have begun to look at the military um, as an example of soldiers who respond in four different ways when it comes to uh, ad, you know, adversarial conditions. Uh, the one group is just completely vulnerable and the moment they get put you know, into, into the heat of the battle, they just fold. Um, the second group, it doesn't really seem to make much difference. They just push through. The third group, uh, sorry, and the first group um, suffers what has now been classified as, as uh, post-traumatic stress. Um, the third group does kind of a bending but not breaking. And, and this is actually where the word resilience uh, was first used way back um, in the 1600s, if my research is right. Um, we then started to use it in engineering to talk about springs, that springs would be compressed and then they would return back to, to their original state. And I think there's something about that, you know, that we can talk about in terms of resilience. But the fourth group um, in the military is the group that actually doesn't just bounce back, but bounces forward and almost thrives as a result of the, the opposition HP. Um, mm. and, and so they talk there about a post-traumatic growth. Um, and so for me, I'm now trying to understand as a leader, how can we help people develop that, that in the midst of the pandemic, you know, when we think about that spiritually, emotionally, physically, financially, relationally, it's been tough. I mean, we've all really had to, um, you know, dig deep. But how out of this as leaders can we, you know, rather than, you know, uh, see this as being almost, you know, impossible, see this as an opportunity to use this learning um, to bounce forward and to thrive and to incorporate, um, you know, the learning into, into our own legacy as leaders. So for me, that would be an important part of the resilience piece. Yeah, I mean, no, I think, Annie, you're correct. You know, true leaders emerge in difficult times, uh, not when the road is flat and the surface are level. Um, there's a very important um, reflection here that I think it's valuable to share from Herman Duplessis. Thank you for that, Herman. Strategic alignment comes with clarity in the midst of uncertainty. Leaders cannot provide certainty anymore, definitely. Uh, Self-leadership is asking the right questions, absolutely. And then I also add, having 15 years of military experience myself, I still think it is the best place for leaders to develop. Uh, it is extremely practical, uh, organized, and maybe that tie back to your point of project management and working into the detail earlier on. Um, now, Andy, you said uh, when we opened up uh, this afternoon um, about the whole thing about trust, and uh, somewhere later you made the point you don't want to talk politics. Um, but I want to ask the question, if you look at our current day and age of the people leading us in the country, without mention of a specific individual or group or so, uh, I think we must cut it across industries and maybe not look at politicians, but let's say the model managers and, and the CEOs that lead us, um, moving into this, this new world, um, they definitely have some challenges. And, you know, with your reflections on experience and engaging with those 3,500 people, in eight countries, what would you say are the biggest or, or the easiest or the best way of them to overcome uh, their own limitations to become good leaders? Well, if, if you're asking the question, HP, in the context of trust, then I think we need to understand what trust is. And we also need to understand that there's a paradox going on here in this new world of work. Maybe I must address the paradox first. Yeah. Here's the challenge. There's research that comes, comes out of MIT that says, the further away I am from you geographically, the less likely I am to trust you. I mean, that just makes sense. If I can't see you, if we're not having coffee together, if we're not getting the water cooler moment, that social cohesion is that much more difficult. But the paradox is that the further away I am from you, the more I need to trust you. And so um, if you think about how trust is developed, um, we go back to, to the work of, of, of Bruce Tuckman and others, you know, the forming, storming, norming, performing um, theories that we used of team development. Great in its day. The problem with that is that when I get thrust into a Zoom meeting with parts of the organization that I've never met, 
and I'm now being asked to collaborate, my mindset cannot be, give me a reason to trust you because there isn't the time. We now have to begin to work together. And, and so the mindset has to start with, give me a reason not to trust you. And it has to assume positive intent. And certainly in the research I've been doing with some IT companies, HP, that are really mastering this new world of working virtually, that assuming positive intent, assuming the best in terms of competency and character um, is really important. And of course, then the challenge is that it means that you're making yourself much more vulnerable. And Brene Brown has done some great work on trust and vulnerability. And I think for us as leaders, we often don't want to go there because we, we run the risk of being disappointed. We run the risk of if I delegate something to somebody else and they don't do it the way I want to do it, you know, what are the, what are the consequences? And so let me just do it myself anyway. So I, you know, as, here's the interesting thing, HP. We're probably better connected with more tools and more resources to work remotely than ever in the history of the world of work. The gap that we have right now is the human factor in being able to breathe life into this to allow people to really go for it and work and shine to their best ability if they do not have leaders who trust them. And so I think this trust factor is going to be a huge quotient uh, going forward as an enabler of everything we've spoken about, you know, in the last 35 minutes or so. Yeah. No, thank you, Andy. And I see there's a comment from, from Philip de Kock, who say, you know, uh, uh, obviously, it, it, when talking about resilience and its foundations, it comes from positive psychology. We can look at the work of Martin Seligman, a great editor for further yep. research. So, uh, uh, definitely, I think, Philip, that's uh, the very, very valuable. And uh, it's definitely an area that uh, we remind our students of, of interest in furthering their studies postgrad level to consider. And uh, if you have the the urge to do that, you know, you're welcome to talk to us. But uh, to the point, uh, I think that's positive, of, of really important. And then Herman Duplessis uh, made the comment that trust is given and not earned. And that's a quote from Simon Sinek. And so I also think it's, it's, it's extremely valuable. Um, so anyway, with this being said, and, you know, I've opened the conversation today and we have about uh, 23 minutes, so uh, we still have some time. Um, uh, looking at the, the new world of work and the, the book I'm currently reading, um, how, in your mind, how should we think about leadership in future? As we go away year after, back to our works tomorrow. And, you know, um, yesterday I had a discussion with somebody that's also in the audience uh, around the curiosity on future. And I think that's uh, definitely a, a very valuable comment or question. I would love to get your view to that. Well, I think the first um, comment that I want to make, HB, is that I'm not convinced that one person can motivate somebody else. Uh, that may sound like a surprising comment to make. I think that as leaders, we create an environment within which people choose to be motivated. They choose that enabling environment. And so as leaders, if we understand that the new world of work will be a results-only work environment, R-O-W-E, then it's up to me as the leader to respond to that in a way that I need to be checking that my team have a clear sense of purpose, clarity around responsibility, um, the tools that they need for asynchronous and synchronous communication. Um, and the metaphor here that we use, um, HP, is around bandwidth. So, you know, some conversations are high bandwidth, like we're having today, I'm on video, I'm on Zoom, you have my full attention. But the truth is you can't be on Zoom eight hours a day um, you know, you, you just, you, A, you end up with Zoom fatigue, and B, that high level of high bandwidth, highly synchronous inter interaction is not possible when you multiply that over 10 or 12 or 15 members of a team. So certain yeah. subjects and certain issues require higher bandwidth. Others will require low bandwidth. This could be, you know, something on Slack or something on a message on Teams. The, 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 the point is not the tool you use. It's the understanding of the purpose of that tool and how you want people to engage. And then I think the third level will be storage. Where do we have the repositories for documents and for files and for access and for the, the micro learning that you spoke about? So I think uh, learning and leadership are going to be much more closely tied.
but it's going to look very different. I think understanding of bandwidth and the expectations we lay on people in terms of being at every meeting and being involved in every decision and how those decisions are made is going to change radically. And I think that those companies that can navigate um, the best tools, and by that, I'm not suggesting you know, that that means more tools, HP. In fact, in many cases, less is more, but also have created the psychological safety and the clarity and the support. It's those organizations, I think, that are going to really come out better than those that are stuck in a 20th century mindset, um, which is really just not going to work in this new way of working. Now, uh, thank you, Andy. Um, I, I had a discussion, I'm reflecting back on a discussion um, earlier this week, or maybe it was last week, with uh, our CEO and Vice Principal, Prof. Benny Anderson. And uh, what we've said to each other, I think it was on Thursday evening, uh, it's important when we engage with business leaders, uh, our doctoral students, people that we're training, executive training, uh, that we also look beyond the economic uh, objectives and, and start looking at the, the social part of it and, and you know, the effect of society. And maybe the question we should ask ourselves is in all these endeavors that we're running, what is the social return on investment? And because uh, as, as leaders, you know, a lot of leaders would love to leave a legacy behind, but, but that's not it. You know, they, they need to leave a, a better position and um, environment behind for our next generation. So the, the social return on investment is, is probably getting a, a more prominent focus these days. I'm not sure if I'm reading that incorrectly, Andy. No, I think you're reading it spot on, um, HP. And as a fellow marketer, you know, one looks at trying to understand return on investment, but you'll also appreciate that a lot of this is intangible. Yeah. So the challenge to convince our accountants, you know, is, is how do you sell the intangible? Um, but I think it's a no-brainer, HP, that if leaders are going to operate in the reputation economy, first of all, they have to be true to themselves they have to be leaders of integrity. Um, and, I, and I am going to put a moral qualifier on that because I think you can be true to what you say you will do um, and not necessarily be um, you know, a, a, a good leader. There are many examples through history of leaders who were you know, leaders of integrity, but we look back on them now and we realize that they were true to what they said they would do, but they were horrible people and terrible leaders. So integrity has got to be more than that. It's got to be wholeness. It's mm. got to be about understanding cause and effect. It's got to be about understanding the repercussions. It can't be short-term wins only. Uh, somebody quoted Simon Sinek earlier, and he talks about the infinite game. So very mm. often in business, we focus on the finite game, the mm. year-end report, the shareholder performance, um, the stock price, uh, whether we hit our sales target or not, all of which is great, but to your question, HB, I think that the scoreboard is changing. And now the, the social capital, the sustainable development goals, the meaning in society, those are things that the generation coming through are often asking first before they ask questions about paycheck or do I get a corner office, even if I can have an office anymore um, as a result of lockdown. It's much more about what is the contribution that this organization is making to the whole. And that's why I loved what Mark was saying earlier about approaching these wicked problems from a, a, a systems approach. And maybe just a, you didn't ask me to do this uh, plug HP, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, one of the greatest things that I came out from Da Vinci with was uh, a deeper appreciation of, on the one hand, the complexity of the world, and on the other hand, the fact that sometimes a systems approach can help to try and not always be the only solution, but one way to navigate that. And, and I'm eternally grateful for that. So to come back to what somebody said earlier about is this thought leadership, I think it does start with a new way of thinking and a worldview, because that's going to then talk to our values and our beliefs and, and the way we lead and the way we behave. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, no, um, Andy, no, no, I, I definitely agree with you on that one. I'm just looking at the comments here and I see um, Janet say, Joy, she's critical, so she agree. And she say, we cannot make anyone engage, but if you create the right environment, and I think that's what you've been, been saying to us, you can uh, almost um, uh, give a, 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 an environment where, you know, you almost um, 
right, the opportunity for those people to come to the fore. And to your point um, of, of leaders being born and being trained into, uh, I saw see Philip say, um, as a leader, one need to influence the talent pipeline. And I actually want to come back to that point. Herman is saying uh, there's a purpose question is also good for self-leadership. And I think behind those three remarks, and the question is probably, and, and you've touched on that earlier on, uh, what can one do to motivate your team? And you said, you know, uh, it take, cannot one person to motivate uh, a team in there. What can you do to motivate a team? If it's an individual's responsibility, is it a joint responsibility? Uh, must you light the fire? What's your advice, Andy? Well, again, just to, to come back without laboring the point, HP, I, I, there's nothing in my research that shows me that I can motivate you um, if you were my direct report or my team member. What I can do is I can create an environment which is paralyzing and gripping and hostile uh, where you will not shine. I can also create an, a climate of trust, of you know, clear understanding of what is expected, of regular micro like uh, micro monitoring rather than micromanagement. And I can talk to that if you want. Um, I think those are some of the key ingredients that you then are motivated within that, as long as it's aligned to some sense of purpose. But I, I, again, I'm not convinced that I can motivate you at all, HP. Yeah. No, okay, but Andy, you, you gave us a challenge. So it's about creating the right climate. And I, yeah. and I think that's it. So the question is, you know, how do we do that? Um, if, if, and I've asked you the, the, the monit or, or mentoring question earlier on, but I want to touch base with that after reflecting on what you've said, you know, um, who do you look up for inspiration and mentorship? Because what I listen here this often is it's fascinating to listen. You've got a wealth of wisdom in your head, but, but who do you look up? What do you read? Uh, where do you get your inspiration? <laughs> who mentors you, Andy? Yeah. So maybe just a, a personal reflection that, the book, the leadership, leadership, the exponential effect that I wrote, um, I think was first of all for me to try and navigate my own challenges of COVID as I faced, you know, the severe constraints of cancellations and the possibility of no work for six months. So that gave me an opportunity to dig deep HP in terms of reading, in terms of reaching out to people that I that I trust deeply. I, I'm not gonna mention names. I think that would be unfair on a call like this and they'd probably be hugely embarrassed. But let me say this on the mentorship piece. I think sometimes we look for mentors and we want them to be a kind of, you know, one size fits all for everything. And what I've learned over my, you know, lifetime is that I can have different people mentoring me in different parts of my life. So there are people that I bring in to speak into my personal life, um, into, my, into my marriage, into my family. I have people that I draw to in terms of my financial planning. I have people that I look to who are very successful in terms of leading large organizations. I have, you know, as an academic, some academic mentors. So I think mentorship is different to coaching. Mentorship is usually initiated by the mentee. It's usually informal, and it's usually a relationship that's outside of the organization. And if you can find a couple of people that you know, you know, who would I call at 12 o'clock at night um, if I was really in trouble? Um, if you can have that um, you know, peer accountability HP. So one of the other comments I make with leaders is that if you're part of a large multinational and you're on a board, and I sit on a couple of boards of, of NPOs, there's a level of accountability. There's a CFO, mm -hmm. there may be a CEO, there may be a, a company secretary, and everybody's got their roles, and you have to give account. Um, when you work for yourself, or you're an entrepreneur, or maybe you're a husband or a father or a, a parent, you don't always have that board uh, in the formal sense. So creating that network of people that you can allow to speak into your life, um, I think is so important. And that requires trust and vulnerability. Um, it requires a discussion around common values. So for me, that personal accountability board is really important. Um, and in the book, there are some very powerful stories that inspired me. Maybe just a, another quick uh, point on the inspiration, HP. One of the ladies that I interviewed, um, because I'm fascinated about women in leadership, I'm really fascinated about celebrating particularly black women in leadership in the African context, 
is doing some phenomenal work right now in acknowledging um, women across sub-Saharan Africa and Southern Africa in terms of the role that they're playing. And that inspires me. So I'm having interviews over the last week or so where we're celebrating women in leadership, you know, whether it's in, in the aviation or the CEO of banks or people in research in, in chemical engineering or construction, women who would not usually be celebrated, the light wouldn't be shone on them, but I'm really inspired by these stories. And mm -hmm. I think HP, we need to be looking harder for these opportunities to celebrate examples because we can become so obsessed with where it's gone wrong. We can yeah. become so obsessed with the vacuum that we see in leadership. Um, and in fact, when we start looking, there are incredible examples of men and women in this country and around the world who are leading superbly, but mm. often doing it unnoticed. Yeah. No, Andy, it's, it's almost like you read my mind. You know, I, I, one of our recent doctoral graduates uh, did a study on, on feminists and, you know, all female in, in leadership. Uh, and you, the audience, you know, you're welcome to go to our website and, and, and have a look at that thesis of, of Premi Nika. But, but uh, I've been toying with this idea and I'm busy lining up a, a full panel of, of female only. Talk about that topic. And then you know, I, I think uh, I will touch base with you, but okay, we can keep that, that out um, in different discussion. But that one is definitely important and I fully agree with you. Uh, I see uh, Tia Pelsa asked a question and, and maybe Tia, you can maybe answer your own question or if somebody from the audience would love to respond to that or me and Annie will jump in. So what is it then the impact of inspiration if a leader can't motivate the team? Um, now, I've got a view on, on the difference between motivation and inspiration. You know, I, I prefer to say rather inspire than to motivate. The one can take it just so, so far. Um, you can bring a person to the water, but you can't make him drink. Uh, and so inspiration is definitely giving them purpose. And I think that's what Simon Sinek is saying. But Tia, yeah, you... Do you have a specific view on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think of, of our specific um, leaders and, and I mean, the well-known one in our country is Madiba. And, and for me, he was an inspiration. And, and clearly, well, that motivated me, which would then, you know, agree with what, what Andy is saying. So, um, yeah, I, I really just wanted his view on, you know, so if it's not my motivation, is it inspiration? And what does that look like in terms of leadership? Um, nowadays. Andy? So HP, I'm really nervous to get back to leadership theory where we set up the heroic charismatic leader. I think we may, and, and that's not certainly what, what Tia is suggesting by any means, but I think we've moved on, HP, from this idea that the leader is always on the white horse, you know, flying the flag, and we're all kind of um, you know, just totally enamored by his or her ability to, 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 to lead from that point of inspiration. I mean, there are those historical contexts, but I think the world has changed. And I think we're going to see a much more networked, collaborative leader who, yes, can inspire through positivity. Um, a, a, another learning that I took away from Da Vinci HP many years ago was this idea of the fact that the, the future is not one, but many. Um, mm. and that we can have not just a probable future, but a preferred future. And so I think leadership is about painting that preferred future and saying to people, look, if we do nothing, this is the end result. If we do something, this is a possible future. This is what I think we should do, you know, come on the journey with me. But yeah. ultimately, people have to make the choice whether they embrace that preferred future or not, and whether they are prepared to apply themselves in, you know, not just buy-in, but alignment to that and giving themselves to that preferred future from a leader-follower diet. Yeah. And, you know, and, I, and um, no, I'm, I'm laughing to you because I, I, I know I asked that question and, and to, to your response, uh, I wrote a piece myself uh, a year, year and a half ago on, on uh, leadership. And I think I posted it back then on my LinkedIn profile. And I said, for me, there's, there's certain qualities, you know, leader must be trustworthy and accountable. And, and we spoke about that. And I would say that's definitely the other point is um, uh, inspire people rather than motivate. And, and, and you know, I've, I've got a very clear position on that. So by asking that question to me myself, my reflection back then was, 
there are certain characteristics of a great leader. And I said, as uh, and you mentioned Madiba, I said uh, in that specific piece, I reflected on Cyril Ramaphosa. And it was beginning of last year, so I'm going to say, is first of all to contextualize strategies. And then early on, on, Andy, you said we must make the right calls and decisions for our, our industry and our context and, and our continent. So it's to contextualize the right strategies. Uh, one of the, the questions that uh, you reflected on was focusing on the execution of strategies. Hence, I asked that to you. And uh, I also think in, in that climate that you spoke, Andy, is to create a conducive environment to unlock the full potential of employees. And uh, Janet, you mentioned that uh, uh, dance, the tango between the, the leader and the, the employer. And I think lastly, for me, as a, as a leader, we should not be scared. We should always embrace change. Uh, if, if nothing's changing, we, we, we're stagnating. So we must be uncomfortable with stability. At the moment, there's a degree of, of change and there's some tension. Uh, for me, that's the, the breeding ground for, for moving forward. If I just look at the Nobel Prize winners, um, they were not recognized in their own time, most of them, but they were, were, were not content with the current situation and by pushing that. So my view on this, you know, um, we should not take things for granted. We always say, what can I change? So change must um, um, maybe be on the forefront. And, and you mentioned servant leadership. And when I speak to Brant uh, Pretorius on, on his book of servant leadership, uh, you say the same thing, embrace change, you know, um, don't be scared of change, stand close to change. And then in fact, uh, ask yourself, what can you change? But change that through people. Don't use change as a disruptor. Uh, you must change as a positive outcome. So, so that's um, my own experience. And I see there's also a comment from Herman, uh, does the example of the leader, uh, does the example of the leader motivate their teams? Um, I firmly believe in self-leadership. And in my experience, if the leader leads themselves well, they become an example and people follow them. Um, you know, so, so, so I think that's the point of my, of my question. Does the example of the leader and the way that they lead and live their lives, does that motivate their teams in a way or doesn't it have any impact? Yeah, I think we can start to debate whether it's inspirational motivation, HP, to your point. But Herman, you're right. I mean, as I watch you lead and you do that from the basis of integrity, you do that from the basis of an authentic leadership style, it compels me to look at myself and I then make the choice whether I want to follow or not. But I think that's the point I want to make is that ultimately, um, you know, I have to make that choice. No mm. other person can motivate me. Motivation comes from within. Um, mm. And conversely, when you don't lead by example and you are not congruent and you're inauthentic, I also make a choice. Um, so I think it is all about what choices do you elicit uh, in your followers and in your stakeholders. Um, and it comes back to the question of buy-in and alignment. But yes, mm. to your point, there is a relationship between the leader's personal example and the response in the team, and we could just debate whether that's inspirational or motivation. Excellent. Thank you for that, Andy. Um, I'm mindful of the time. We've got two minutes left, so this is maybe where I must take the lead and say, let's wrap it up and conclude. So, Andy, thank you very much for, for your insight, your, your wisdom, and sharing your experience with us. Um, be assured, I will definitely be one of the first people that, that buy that book. Um, my question is, where can we find the book, Leadership, the Exponential Effect? Uh, you've mentioned that it will be available in, in November. Um, is there a website we can go and have a look at exclusive books? We can, because yeah. I, I so, quite often you refer to that and there's more. So I want to read that book. Okay. So at the moment, we're taking pre-orders um, uh, HP and people can just go to the exponentialeffect.com and then just give me some indication of whether they want a, a, a paperback or an ebook. Um, we are talking to the distributors right now. I'm busy signing a distribution agreement. I think what will probably happen is we'll do a limited edition pre-release, um, just navigating COVID here towards the end of the year, yeah. and then do a larger, so it will be available in the bookstores, but okay. I certainly will have the ebook up in November, and we will take you know personal orders from that website, uh, and we can do signed coffee, copies if people want it as well. Yeah. Excellent. No, thank you for that. And Andy, also for your, your time here this afternoon and, and sharing some. Uh, it's definitely a topic that uh, we can explore and, and we need more time. 
and also to uh, Mark Eccles and uh, Supervisor Prof. Paul Singh for the first part. Uh, it's much appreciated. Um, I know it's been a long two hours, but I thoroughly enjoyed the discussion. And, you know, uh, I uh, probably will, will struggle to sleep this evening, switching off my brain just to reflect on, on some of these um, wisdoms that you shared with us. And also to the audience for taking time to, to uh, join us here this afternoon, for posing questions, uh, for participating in that. Uh, we appreciate that much, and uh, we really enjoyed this roundtable discussion. Um, Dr. Andy Brock, thank you very much. Mr. Mark Eccles, much appreciated. And to all the audience members, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.